Good morning and welcome to Fiorano's webinar on PSD2 Open Banking with APIs. I'd like to familiarize you or I'd like you to take a minute to familiarize yourself with the event options. Uh, you will be kept on uh, mute during the entire presentation. Uh, as you can see, you can adjust your screen to have a full screen mode. Uh, there will be a Q&A session. Uh, as we go through the presentation, please type your questions into the box at the bottom right hand side of the screen with your questions and at the end of the session we will answer all and every question possible. And if you need any assistance in the meantime, please uh, type uh, it, that into the chat window and we'll address it with, uh, with the host. So we look forward to starting in a minute from this from now while uh, a, a few other people sign on. But in the meantime, please familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with the operations of the webinar. Good morning. This is Tom Stack. I'm the Vice President of Sales for Fiorano Software. Uh, thank you very much for joining the Fiorano webinar on PSD2, the Open Banking with Ed APIs. Uh, today our speakers will be Jason Bloomberg. Jason is a leading industry analyst and expert in agile architecture. Uh, best known uh, many years ago for funding ZapThink. He advises on digital transformation initiatives and has written many books on agile architecture, service oriented architecture and, and the relationship of technology to business. Uh, joining Jason today will be Atul Sayani. Atul is the founder of and C uh, CEO and CTO of Fiorano Software. Uh, Atul has been a leader in the integration and SOA peer to peer distributed processing uh, technology front and was one of the first entrepreneurs to understand the power of microservices. Um, at this point I'd like to introduce Jason Bloom Bloomberg. Jason, take it away. Well thank you very much Tom. So let's just go ahead and get started. Yeah I see I have uh, the control. So uh, moving, moving right along just a bit about me if we can get the slide to go forward. There it is. Um, so I'm president of Intellix. We're focused on agile digital transformation, which just so happens is the name of my next book coming out later this year. Uh, last book, Agile Architecture Revolution, we also published the Agile Digital Transformation Roadmap poster. And uh, on my final slide, I'll, I'll give you the URL for that so you can download it. So let's dive right into it. So uh, what is PSD2? Well. First of all, uh, PSD2 is the second version of PSD, as the two would indicate. The Payment Services Directive has actually been around now for a, a full decade, so it's been enforced for quite a while. Uh, it, it centers on Europe, so it's a set of regulations that drive payment services and providers in Europe, and it's been in effect for quite a while. So if you've been in the financial services or fin, uh, fintech area in Europe, uh, you've probably interacted with the uh, PS, PSD uh, regulations. Well, PSD2 is the essentially the next version of this. It's a major rewrite. Uh, uh, as these things go, regulations take quite a while to rewrite, and this is a very complex set of regulations, so it's been in the works now for four years, but we're, we're you know, nearing uh, the full launch. Uh, so it's designed to, to solve a number of problems uh, with PSD. You know, better consumer protection and security. Security, of course, is always important. Uh, Europe is particularly concerned with consumer protection as well, so that's built into this uh, set of regulations. Emerging payment methods, right, that weren't around uh, in 2007 when PSD first hit the scene. So mobile phone-based payment approaches and other modern technologies are supported. Uh, and then uh, one of the key things that we'll talk about as well that really impacts the discussion uh, this morning is the direct connection between merchants and banks via APIs instead of using intermediaries. So we're disintermediary, disintermediating the interactions and that creates uh, many opportunities as well as many challenges. So 
But moving right along, um, I mentioned that PSD2, PSD as well as PSD2 are European regulations, but don't, don't let that fool you. This has a global impact because most of the banks and other financial services firms doing business in Europe are multinationals and they also do business outside of Europe. And the way the regulations work for uh, multinational companies is they have to comply with all the regulations and all the jurisdictions they do business even when they're doing business outside of those jurisdictions. So if a bank that does business in Europe is based in the U.S. doing business in the U.S., they still have to comply with European regulations. So PSD2 is, in essence, as well as you know, many other uh, uh, modern regulations, are truly global regulations. Uh, furthermore, if you think about the smartphone infrastructure that we have today, right? It's just uh, uh, the borders have dropped. You know, it used to be just a few years ago you had to get an international phone, you had to switch out your SIM cards, you had to do all these things to move from country to country. That's becoming less and less the case. Right in the U.S., we can bring our phones to Europe. We don't have to do anything. They work. We don't have to worry about it. And that's happening around the world now. So as a result, if I'm making a payment, um, I could be for a merchant anywhere in the world. I may be located anywhere in the world, and my phone service may be provided by a service provider who is based anywhere in the world. Right. So, so the 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 borders have dropped and as a result the payment infrastructure that is now increasingly mobile driven is now global so it's global in terms of the location of the merchants the customers as well as the the service providers and the third parties that we'll talk about in in, uh, in a moment so uh, another key thing to keep in mind about this regulation is it's not just uh, something that you may or may not want to comply with depending upon uh, what kind of business you want to do. For, for many organizations, it mandates compliance, right? So the things that you have to change in the way you're doing business for many different kinds of organizations. So you can't just say, well, I'll just keep doing things the way I have been doing. We've been compliant in the past. That's not good enough, right? Uh, this kind of major uh, regulation shift is, is an imperative for any number of different types of firms that now must understand how to comply technically as well as on the business side and then must make the changes at the appropriate appropriate uh, time, you know, to meet the appropriate uh, regulatory deadlines. So um, some of the key things about PSD2 to, to keep in mind is that it introduces a number of different types of third parties to this broad ecosystem of uh, uh, payment in, uh, intermediary, well not intermediaries, but third parties, and then it regulates them. So it says, okay, we have to have these types of parties, and then here are the rules about how they operate. So some of the terminology, and uh, Tool will be using these uh, in his section as well, uh, there's the third party payment providers, the TPPs, and it's a general category that includes in particular payment initiation service providers, the PISPs, as well as account information service providers, AISPs. So the payment initiation services providers, they are in there in interacting uh, as part of the payment uh, process where the account information service providers are uh, acting as uh, informational third parties parties, but nevertheless, they still have uh, constraints and responsibilities as per the regulation. So some of the things that this introduces, well, obviously, more technical complexity, right, because there's many different ways that different parties can interact with each other that has to be secure and performant. But there's also new business opportunities, right? These, uh, these uh, third parties are now uh, potential businesses that you may want to start or you may be working for and there's these new opportunities uh, and then also keep in mind that all of these TPPs the third-party payment service providers will be operating in the cloud these are SaaS based uh, services so everything here is cloud centric from the perspective of the third parties and mobile centric from the perspective of the end customer so that's essentially the way of the world in the 21st century uh, and uh, reflected in PSD2 where in 2007, when PSD came along, it just wasn't, the world wasn't like that. Right? The world's completely changed in the last 10 years. So, moving right along, if we can get this slide to go, there it is. Okay. So, a key thing to keep in mind now about the role that APIs play. Uh, Previously to PSD2, the primary mode of interaction between merchants and banks has been through an intermediary, 
right? If you go into a retailer, you get your credit card, you swipe the machine, uh, the money doesn't go from your bank account to the merchant's bank account directly, right? In the past, it hasn't been that way. There's always been the intermediary, which could be the credit card company or other intermediaries, depending upon the nature of the transaction. So for business-to-business -business transactions, there's the SWIFT network and there's other bank-to-bank uh, -bank networks that act as intermediaries. So that's been the way that um, uh, both consumer banking with credit cards or with other, you know, um, uh, consumer banking uh, you know, payment approaches as well as the business business world have always up to this point worked through intermediaries and that's just been the standard way of doing business. Well with PSD2 we're disintermediating, right? We're disintermediating. We're, we're eliminating these intermediaries. So now uh, the, the um, retailer interacts directly with the consumer's bank. So if you make a payment at a store, then the money goes from your bank account to the retailer's bank account without having to go through the uh, a third uh, uh, you know, third party bank. So uh, so this raises the bar from that for the technology because essentially uh, we need API support everywhere, right? Everything is done via APIs. Everything has to be secure, but we have these multiple party interactions. So it's not just point to point anymore, right? Point to point security is hard enough, but it's at least something we understand, you know, with you know, having gone through SSL in the 1990s. This is raising the bar, right? This is multiple party security. Um, consumer protections, as I mentioned, especially important in Europe, but really important around the world. That is essential to compliance, so protecting the consumer their, and their, uh, obviously their money, so you know they're not being defrauded, but also their privacy, the privacy of their personal information, that is critically important as well. And then, of course, we're expecting all of, we as in the consumers are expecting all of these transactions to be in real time, to be high performance, that is, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many people are making a transaction, you know, if everybody's using their, their payment mechanism in, the, in a big store at the same time, it shouldn't slow down. And then it's resilient, right? If there is a problem, it should come back to life, you know, just the way you expect from any cloud-based um, uh, system. So, so essentially what we're saying here is now these are not just technology nice-to-haves. These are technology must-haves, right, by regulation. You have to get this stuff right, right? It's not just a question of hope to get it right or get it right most of the time. Regulation says you have to get this stuff right. So we're raising the bar, right? The, the technology world has told the business world, hey, we can do all this great stuff with APIs and with modern security and, and with mobile technology. And the business world is telling the technology world, okay, put your money where your mouth is. You better get this stuff right. So the burden is on, on you, the audience for this webinar, to get this stuff to work properly, securely, uh, for, and complying with the regulations. So this is a key, key point, right? This is a new way of, of looking at how regulations are driving technology innovation. We're expecting these APIs to work. We're expecting them to be fully secure. So the burden is on you now to make sure that happens. Right. So we, we no longer have the closed networks. Well, we still have them, but we're moving away from them. The PSD2 is essentially an open approach, right? RESTful APIs, internet-based interactions, right? We're not using closed networks. We're not using proprietary protocols anymore. Closed networks and proprietary protocols were a must-have up until, you know, 10 years ago because that was how we were able to secure business-to-business -business interactions. Well, now we're saying, hey, we can do the same level or even better security with open APIs. They're RESTful. They, they're standard protocols as opposed to proprietary. Uh, and even so, we can deliver better security. So the bar is raised even though some of the protections that we've used in the past, the closed networks and the proprietary protocols, are now falling away, right? So essentially, we're jumping into the deep end and we've taken off our life jacket first, right? So we have both greater risk and greater responsibility as well as fewer of the old protections that we used to rely upon. So uh, this is essentially now the context for this new world. And but keep in mind, this isn't just business to business interaction. These are payments, right? These are the most secure types of consumer-oriented interactions uh, that you would expect to be able to support. And that's why this regulation is both so important as well as so stringent. Okay, so um, 
a key thing to keep in mind about compliance uh, is that compliance is mandatory. And it's easy enough to say, everybody sort of understands, yes, regulations, you have to comply with them. Um, but there are some subtleties to this notion of co uh, mandatory compliance. First of all, compliance must be verifiable. Right? It's not good enough simply to be compliant. You have to have the appropriate audit trail. You have to be able to prove you're compliant and prove you were compliant at whatever point in the past is subject to inspection, right? So audit trails, uh, you know, immutable records, uh, full, you know, uh, full analysis so that you can uncover the, the full, you know, end-to-end -end transaction record for any transaction anywhere in the system at any point in time is part of the regulation, right? So the verifiability is part of now the technical requirement. It's not good enough simply to have transactions. The verifiability is every bit as important as the transaction itself. And then keep in mind as well, if you experience a breach, if, you, if somehow a hacker gets through, even if you thought you did everything right, even if you thought you were fully compliant, simply the fact that you experienced a breach puts you out of compliance. Okay, so you might say, but wait a minute, it's the hacker's fault. They found it's some sort of zero-day attack. It was a zero-day attack, so how are we supposed to know? Right, it's a zero-day attack. The whole point is we didn't know. Right, that's not good enough. Right. That's not good. You're still out of compliance, which means that your organization still has to pay the fines and has the bad PR, which is often worse than the fines themselves, simply because a hacker figured out a way to compromise your system. So this is serious stuff, right? The security is now not only something that is important to protect your customers, but you're protecting your business from being out of compliance. Um, and, and protecting your CEO from getting his or her name in the papers as being the CEO of a company who just you know lost however many millions of dollars to some you know hackers from some other country because they were to, able to discover this uh, this uh, zero day attack that nobody had come up with before. So blaming the hackers isn't good enough. We're raising the bar on this. So you might say, you might be thinking now, oh, wait a minute, this sounds like too much trouble. Uh, too late. It's too late to think that. Right? Your, your organizations are required to comply. It's already too late. You have to get this stuff right. You can't back out. Just because it's complicated and it puts your organization at risk if the hackers break in is not a reason not to do it. But you don't have a reason not to do it. You have to do it. So that's, that's the fundamental lesson here. Okay, so... Um, just a sort of a, a bit of the context now. I mentioned the different uh, uh, third-party payment providers, the TPPs, Oop, went a little too far, uh, and uh, the PISPs and the AISPs, but you also have a number of other parties. So this slide is, is a, an oversimplification. It's messy enough as it is. This is an oversimplification, and you'll see this in our tool slides because he goes more in depth into the, what, the, what these arrows really represent. The point here is that we have multiple parties. Even though we've disintermediated, right, we still have multiple parties. We have the merchant, merchant's bank, the customer's bank, the customer themselves, these third parties we talked about. And then we, the, we may have the merchant website which may be at a third party, may be running in a cloud, right? So it's not just a consumer going into a store and swiping a credit card or waving their phone over some sensor. It may be online. So that website is also one of the parties involved. And then if, if they are using their phone, there's the mobile back end as well, which could be at the service provider, right? So there's, third, there's multiple third parties. And all of these arrows represent possible message flows, and everything has to be secure, and everything has to be performant, and it's all done by a restful modern APIs that can now send traffic right over the internet. It doesn't require uh, private networks. Like you could use them, of course, but it doesn't require them. So this is really the context, right? How do we get all this right? And that's essentially um, where, where uh, you know, Atul is going to pick up uh, the discussion. So that's it for my talk. So there's my contact information. My Twitter is the eBiz Wizard. If you want a copy of our poster, go to agiledigitaltransformation.com, and it's a free download. So uh, if you haven't gotten one yet, by all means, looks good on your uh, cube walls. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Atul. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Atul Seni. I am the president of Fiorano, and I'm going to jump straight into uh, the details of what what Jason was discussing. So everyone's everyone's talking about PSG two, and there's a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of talk of APIs and security. All, all you keep hearing is APIs and security. So what we're going to talk about here and show you is 
what the system actually looks like and what it means in practical terms. So the first thing is the PSD2 regulation essentially ensures that there's a, every consumer has a single consolidated location where all of their financial information is kept. For example, in practical terms it means the following. Suppose you've got three bank accounts, which is HSBC, Barclays, and Deutsche Bank. Today you've got separate security tokens for each bank, and each bank has its own kind of software. You've got to go in there, create beneficiaries in a certain way, etc., etc., etc. And they're all a bit different, which can be very painful. With PSD2, you'll have this third-party entity called PISP, the Payment Information Service Provider, where you create an account, and then you put all your banking information into that account your HSBC information, Barclays information, and Deutsche Bank information. And you create a single set of beneficiaries. Now you can simply instruct the PISP and say, you know, from my HSBC account, pay this beneficiary. The beneficiary could be, let's say, EDF, a utility company in, in, in Europe or, or, or anywhere, right? From HSBC, pay EDF. From, from Barclays, pay, uh, you know, Pacific Gas or whatever. And the PISP's job is to then, the PISP is authorized to make the payment on your behalf and the PISP then connects to the bank, creates the secure tunnel and does the entire payment. Uh, a second thing is, and this is again very practical, the PISP and the AISP, essentially PSD2 ensures that every bank that is compliant with the regulation essentially ends up having a front office in the cloud. Now what does that mean? And you notice that when you do a wire transfer, you really don't know whether the transfer has gone through or not. Your bank sends you an email or something saying, oh, transfer complete. What they mean is that they've sent the money, not that the money's arrived. There's really no way to verify other than to, you know, check with the consumer that the money's arrived or not arrived. Most of the time it arrives. But it, it's a very primitive way of doing things. And when you want to check with your bank, what happens? You have to ch the bank systems are actually checking what's called the middle office. They actually banks don't maintain a front office. They don't actually have a maintain a, a record of all the transactions in an organized way. The record is there somewhere in the computer systems, some mainframe systems, some this system, some that system, right? So with PSD2, the PISP then maintains a record of each transaction, and when the transaction finishes, the information comes back to PISP. We'll be looking in detail at the flows shortly. But I wanted to give you an idea of what it actually means. So it makes life very easy for the consumer. You click a button, you log into your, uh, into your PISP account, and you see, okay, for the last three years or N years, these are my payments, this, these payments went through, and, and as Jason had said, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a regulation. So when it goes through, it really has gone through, and there's a cryptographic trace of all the payments, right? So some of the things that, you, you, that you're going to need and what we're going to be talking about in the subsequent slides are the strong authentication mechanism, which also allows two-factor authentication from the bank back to the consumer. Uh, security is obviously very critical. And, uh, you know, the whole system allows all kinds of new business models to be explored. And there's a very complete monitoring and control mechanism for every bank to ensure to, to reduce fraud very significantly. So, uh, with that, we're going to proceed. So, what is the technology? The core technology that is required to implement this centers around API management. Every bank is going to have to have a, an API management platform, but also a significant, significantly uh, a very strong enterprise integration and asynchronous messaging. And we're going to be basically looking at the actual flows and the implementation to show you how these things are very important. So APIs are really the pivotal technology because they're the one, APIs ensure that you have a metered, monitored, and managed access to your systems in a very, in a very secure way. So there's security, there's non-repudiation. That means when in an entity, when one bank or a, or a PISP or AISP connects to the bank, they can't deny that they connected to the bank. There's a cryptographic trace, you see? And and and, and there's tracking of every transaction. Uh, what's the impact? Obviously, new technology. All the banks are going to have to really jump into what is probably today the most modern technology around, right? API management, a full uh, 
digital technology, APIs, integration, asynchronous messaging, and that is something because that those are the those are going to be the core technologies that you're going to use to allow third party connectivity and security. So what it does for you, what does it do for the bank or for all banks? It securely in a managed, metered and monitored way allows the bank to open up its systems to uh, the third party payment payment providers which are going to be the PISPs, right? Uh, to provide them access in a very controlled way. It streamlines the flow of transactions and payments. This, every payment is, uh, that is a very constant and uh, standardized way of tracking, non-repudiation, sending alerts out to the consumer, to the PISP, to the other banks, right? And of course, most critically, the front office of the bank gets created in the cloud automatically because of all this. So this actually saves the bank a lot of money because every bank doesn't have to go and maintain, design a brand new front office, right? The all, the, if a consumer has an account with the PISP, then the front office, the record of all the transactions is in the PISP, whereas the transactions, of course, were actually performed uh, by the bank. The bank has a separate record, but that's kept in the back office systems of the bank, right? So this actually then simplifies things. It's a very... Uh, intelligence system and regulation from that standpoint, right? Here's a sample screenshot, just a simple sample screenshot of what it might look like at a PISP. You'll have your bank accounts uh, up there and then your beneficiaries, you choose a bank account, choose a beneficiary and say pay now and you know the PISP then takes care of all the details. So this really simplifies the life of the consumer significantly. Because if you, I'm sure everyone's had this sort of experience with all the banks. Everyone's software is slightly different. You don't know how to create new beneficiaries. There's 50,000 things to put into the account, and, and you get something wrong. And when you call the bank up, half the people don't know what they're doing. So it's a, it's, a, it's a real problem, right? System architecture, this looks very simple. But as we'll see sort of from the next screen onwards, the flows are uh, a little bit more complex than this. The PISP connects to the banks. The banks need API management platforms and they need core enterprise integration because when an instruction to, for a payment, when the, when, the, when the PISP sends a packet saying pay this from this consumer's account, from this account pay the other beneficiary this much money, then that packet and that instruction has to then talk to the core banking system within the bank. Right? That's where the integration is required. So the integration is required to execute the payment. Right? So every, every single payment is going to require back office integration and that's obviously got to work seamlessly. Right? So what does it look like? So here, here's the flow. This is, the, this is what the flow would actually look like and this is something that we're in the process of implementing at, at several uh, banks which we can't talk about but this is how it works. So the consu consumer first consolidates bank accounts with the PISP, right? So the transfers can be from any bank account to any beneficiary uh, and there's a single interface. That's what it will look like. So when a transfer gets initiated, uh, the PISP creates a secure time-bound tunnel with the bank. So the PISP has a connection to the bank, to the bank's API platform, and there's two levels of security here. There's digital certificates that are used to ensure the transport level security, and once the connection is established, there's an OAuth token that is provided by the bank back to the PISP to authorize the PISP for this particular connection only, and it's time bound. So the time of this whole transaction can, for example, be upper bound can be set at 60 seconds. It's up to the bank. Some banks may want to, you can set it to whatever you want, right? That means that all of the steps in the entire payment process have to be completed within that time bound, right? And the message that is sent is a, is a pain one message, ISO 20022, and that is recorded. So the connection was made. And like I said, there's a full cryptographic trace of everything, right? So before the transfer, now the most important point is the customer, there the, are the, the several things that are mandated in the regulation. 
exchange rates, the transfer fee, the time for payment, the bank actually has to tell the consumer that your payment is going to be completed in this much time. And that's sort of, you know, the time guarantee that they have to keep, right? Then you have to give the exchange rate because you might have different currencies, right? You might have, a tra obviously, all the fees and everything that has to be agreed on, right? And, of course, if the, if the consumer is not happy with that, if the PISP is not happy with that, uh, those can be taken from the preferences of the consumer in the beginning. There's a lot of detail, but essentially, uh, there's a guarantee, and that's again recorded in an ISO message, again fully tracked, there's a cryptographic trace of all these steps, right? Transactions can be stopped or reversed. Uh, it means the transaction doesn't have to go through if the, if the PISP is not satisfied, right? So then if there's a certain limit, if the transaction value exceeds a certain limit, then the bank has to perform, you know, you say, transfer 50,000 euros. Uh, the, the bank is not going to do that just like that. It, it can verify. It does a two-factor authentication with the consumer. So the two-factor authentication is typically done. There are many ways to do it. Mobile phones are a, are a classical uh, way with your registered mobile phone. Uh, a six-digit code or an eight-digit code or any, any number of digits code is sent. And then that's sort of, there's a whole verification process there, right? Again, all of this has to be done within the overall time bound for the complete transaction, right? So once the two-factor authentication process is done, then we proceed to the next step. The bank then packages the transaction, executes the transfer, executes the transfer, right, to the beneficiary bank. Now, it just initiates, there are two steps. It initiates the transfer, and it's done from its side. It's got to wait for the beneficiary bank to get back. And then, uh, in the first step, the bank actually sends a one-way message back to the PISP saying the transfer has been started. But the beneficiary bank, on the other hand, can also interact with the PISP. And there's additional acknowledgement from the banks to the PISP and potentially to the AISP. So what's the difference between PISP and AISP? The PISP, the Payment Information Service Provider, uh, has all the account information consumers can log on and initiate payments. The AISP is just like you know, an ATM in the cloud. You just have your account information there and, and nothing else, really. So just like an ATM in the cloud. So as Jason said, everything is now in the cloud. You make your payments from the cloud. The third-party provider, the PISP, takes a lot of headaches away from the consumer while also creating a lot of additional security. Right? The security means there's OAuth is a very strong uh, uh, security mechanism. And, you know, for instance, when the payment process is happening through the secure tunnel between the PISP and the consumer and, and the bank, the bank is monitoring a lot of things. So for, if a given PISP the bank can put limits on a PISP and say, this PISP is only allowed a certain number of transactions every hour. So if suddenly a PISP is executing 50,000 transactions and they only allow 2,000, those alerts show up very, very quickly and the, and the management of the bank or the systems of the bank can shut that down or raise alerts or let the upper management know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So there's a lot of uh, additional monitoring going on in the background besides the concept of the security tunnel and the digital certificates. So, the solutions, uh, the, the summary, you know, to summarize this whole thing, uh, the whole solution flow is the kind of flow that, that we just went over. Underlying the solution flow, you have a lot of core technology and, and a lot of security concepts, monitoring concepts, integration concepts. And uh, everything is done asynchronously, uh, although the API connection, the connection as a whole is synchronous, and inside that synchronous connection, you've got a lot of asynchronous back and forth messages, right? Two-factor authentication is a key part of it, secured connectivity with a very strong encryption, uh, you know, uh, there's a complete transaction fleet. All of the views, the, the, all of the financial records of a consumer can be viewed in a single interface, log into one place, all your banks, all your, all your transactions, you know everything in, 
in a in a single shot, you know that you know when a payment says it's gone through, it's really gone through, and 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 the third party cannot deny that it's received the money, right? You have transaction history. It's a cryptographic trace of all the transactions. Obviously, um, from a solution standpoint. Um, Everything is very customizable, depending on the kind of technology you have. A Fiorano solution is certainly very customizable. And uh, uh, there's out of the box core banking integration for a number of core banking platforms. Uh, that is straight out of the box. Now, in addition to the payments, uh, simplifying payments, PSD2 also has a fast payment uh, concept. The concept here is that. Uh, a lot of consumers, when you, so for example, you go to retail like Amazon, what you, go, what you do is you give them your credit card, right? So every time uh, you, ch you buy something from Amazon, you know, a, a cut of that transaction goes to the credit card companies. It used to be 3%, 4%, it's down to 1.5%. Maybe, maybe with PSD2, it'll come down to 0.5%. But the concept is to cut the credit card out of the flow completely. And uh, there's a few prerequisites. The, the consumer, as always, has to authorize the PISP to make the payments. That's, that's, that's a straightforward thing. And uh, the merchant has the required customer credentials. That means uh, essentially the following. So the flow would look something like this. If you're the consumer, you go to Amazon and you place an order. Amazon has, you know, in, in the Amazon account with the PISP, with the PSD2 scenario, instead of having your credit card number, you'll have your PSD2 credentials, right? Is PISP credentials. So you say John Doe PISP credential. When you click a button, Amazon will say, hey, I'm just going to send a message to this PISP that it is transfer wise, right? Uh, and the PISP has been, your credentials contain your name and everything. So the PISP knows it's from you, from John Doe, and let's go ahead with the payment. So it does the same thing that we, we talked about before. Uh, this is just a simplified version of it. Initiates the payment. The customer bank verifies the PISP's request. debits the customer account and wires the money to the merchant, right? And then the AISP can be informed, as always, with via one-way messages, and that's all all customizable. Depends on how the bank wants to implement it. The regulation itself doesn't specifically specify these flows, but that's one of the the the, the regulation is only about 40 pages. And it's, it talks about the fact that transactions have to be secure. It talks about a number of those things and, and, and talks about things like, you know, there's got to be exchange rates and time guarantees, but it doesn't really specify how, what the flow should look like. So the, what we've attempted to do here in this webinar is to show you what the, what the flows actually look like uh, from a practical standpoint and, and to talk about uh, the, what PSD2 really really ends up meaning for the consumer and for the bank. So for the bank, it's a very secure way of dealing with payments and it offloads all the front office headaches from the bank, which is huge. For the consumer, the consumer doesn't have to remember 50, uh, you know, N number of tokens for N number of bank accounts. Most people have maybe two or three bank accounts or at least more than one or one or two. And you've got to remember the tokens which can be right which can be a bit complex for a lot of people, right? So uh, it simplifies everything and adds uh, significantly more security, prevents fraud, and is overall a, a really, uh, it's a big step forward for retail banking. Retail, retail banking is really going to be revolutionized quite significantly uh, with this regulation. So, so that uh, concludes uh, my uh, my presentation. What we can do is uh, take take any number of questions here because we got we got a fair amount of time. So uh, please feel free to submit your questions. Yeah. Uh, for the first question. This is Tom Stack once again, and thank it thank you everybody for your paying attention. Uh, and it's from Vikram Israni. Uh, can we get examples of PISPs and AISPs? That would be for you a tool, or yeah, these are just third parties um, that that have got. Uh, these are third parties that are in the process of being created. Now, in practical terms, most banks will end up being both PISPs and AISPs. So those are called ASPSPs. 
the account serv the account service payment service provider. It's a bit of a, a bit of a mouthful, but essentially every bank will want to uh, essentially initiate payments as well. So you, you'll have an interesting situation. You might have an HSBC uh, which says, "Okay, put all your accounts with me." And you're going to tell HSBC about your Barclays account and your Deutsche Bank account. And they will probably end up knowing that you've got this much money in each bank account. They may be able to send you new services to entice you to transfer your money to them. That's a separate issue. But, but in practical terms, all the banks will be PISPs. And there'll be smaller companies, or there can be third parties that can apply just to be a PISP. Right? Or AISP. Depends on. So it creates a. You know, it's it's a good environment for startups. Thank you, Atul. Uh, another question, or it's more of a comment from Varun Badwar. Uh, PSD two will make banks open up providing APIs for AISPs and PIS services. Um, so, I guess again, it's in the same vein as what you just mentioned, Atul. Uh, we'll be seeing a lot of opportunity for startups in this area for providing the AISP and PISP services. Um, there is another question uh, from RK Subramanian. Is it regulatory for all TPPS to provide SAS or can you do this in-house or I guess it would mean on-premise? You can do it in-house on-premise. A lot of banks are doing it in the sense that the AI, the, the, the infrastructure the bank's infrastructure will have to be implemented within the bank, right? So, as far as as far as the bank goes, I mean, each bank is going to put its in, put its own infrastructure in the cloud. But uh, in practical terms, it is in house in the sense that uh, if you're a PISP, you've you've got to ha implement the systems somewhere. And if the PISP also happens to be the bank then it is in-house. So if you're an independent PISP and you're not a bank, then you're probably you know, logically in the cloud somewhere. And, and it's a cloud-to-cloud -cloud inter interaction. Because the API call is essentially uh, over the net. From, it's like a business-to-business -business call. Right? So it, it is cloud-centric in that sense of the term. But if you're a bank being a PISP, then you can do it in-house. Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah I, I would add that it's a, you know, it, you don't want to think that you know cloud-based or on-premises are an either-or situation, right? Obviously, we have the private clouds, but even the notion of a private cloud has been evolving to more of a hybrid IT context, where uh, you know parts of say a bank's infrastructure will be cloud-centric, in that it will be you know fully virtualized and horizontally scalable, and uh, and uh, you know follow the resiliency capabilities of the cloud. Whether they call it a private cloud or whether they think of it as on-premises infrastructure is really more a, a question of semantics. Um, but they will nevertheless have what they would identify as on-premises infrastructure, their core transaction processing, with which banks often still do on mainframes. Uh, so you might have essentially the the uh, PSD2 part of the infrastructure, which is more cloud-centric in its architectural context, and then the core transaction processing part of the infrastructure, which is the, the traditional mainframe-driven context. But then the question is, well, do you want those separate? And uh, you know, one of the key things to keep in mind is that it doesn't make sense to have them separate in an organizational sense. Should it could be it should be a coordinated effort, right? It's the the transaction processing on the mainframe and the APIs and horizontal scalability for the PSA support PSD2 support should be the same team delivering resilient solutions. So now that becomes an organizational challenge for for the banks and other Big providers, so so it's you have to sort of it's sort of, it's sort of a tricky question because it's not just cloud versus on premises. There are all these subtle architectural and organizational questions that are all part of this overall transformation that banks and other uh, large enterprises are going through today. Okay, um, we've got a couple of questions from Gautam Bon. Uh, Gautam has asked, "What would be the effect of companies like Master or uh, Mastercard or Visa with the emergence of PI, uh, PISB?" Due to PSD2, and the second question he has is, what would be the effect of company? Well, same same question. What would be the effect on companies like Mastercard and Visa? Uh, and those are basically probably opinions. So, 
uh, whoever yeah. wants to handle that. It's quite obvious that with PISP, with PSD2, the credit card companies are going to suffer uh, business. Uh, well, the business is going to go down because lots of lots of uh, uh, end users who currently use credit cards for payment completion will probably end up using direct payments. Having said that, credit card companies provide some other functions like uh, they pay the money immediately to the vendor. So, uh, but but essentially, it makes them much more competitive. Already, the rates of Visa and Mastercard, the the rates that they used to charge three percent, they used to be two and a half, three percent. They've come down to one and a half percent. Low, low. They're coming down low by the, uh, <laughs> by the month. So yes, this is going to make the world much more competitive, which is the way it should be. Right. Uh, so I would say, you know, hold on, I'll, I'll pitch in as well. Uh, you know, <clears throat> the, I would say that you know, for Mastercard, Visa, you know, and Amex and, and the other big ones, their traditional credit card business is under pressure. Uh, PSC2 adds to the pressure. Of course, you know the squares and uh, uh, stripes and uh, uh, PayPal's of the world have put it under pressure for a number of years as well, which is part of why the rates are dropping. So uh, what's happening is those 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 enterprises are transforming their business and are looking for multiple different uh, lines of business and revenue streams beyond traditional credit card um, uh, transaction processing. So um, whether any particular one, you know, is Visa going to do better than MasterCard or whatever? That's obviously um, a work in progress. But uh, but these these enterprises are transforming just like everybody else. Uh, it's the, uh, next question from Gary Sheen. Uh, I think SCA would be needed here as well, uh, and that's more in the form of a question: Is it required or needed in this architecture? The Consumer authenticates initially with the PISP, right? So the PISP authentication with the bank really happens through the OAuth token, which is really the best way today uh, to do the authorization. And uh, as far as the two-factor authentication goes, that's that's something that the bank has to really decide on the level of, of security that it wants to use. So yeah, SCA can be used between the PISP and the bank. And uh, on the two-factor authentication side, it's really outside the scope of the PISP regulation. It really depends on the consumer. Jason, you want to add to that? No, that's a, you pretty much covered it. Okay, from uh, David Coleman, what place do you see for blockchain in this regulation? Does blockchain replace the need for the PISPs? No. The blockchain, sorry. <laughs> go ahead, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, J blockchain is a separate type of concept. This is a very straightforward thing, really. It, it is what you saw. What, what you saw in the, in the flows and, uh, and the actual flows between the PISP and the bank, it's quite straightforward, really. Once the connection between the PISP and the bank is made over the API, or over the sort of API tunnel, if you will, you have a secure tunnel for a certain bound, time bound period, let's say 60 seconds or one minute or 30 seconds or whatever the bank decides, right? And then the transaction is in asynchronous set of things happening back and forth between the two. This is very different from blockchain. So it's, 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 an, it's, it's, a, it's an orthogonal kind. Next question. Yeah, I would, well, I would, I would, hold on. I would add that um, it's important to recognize that blockchain is simply not appropriate for real time transactions. Right. In order to commit a transaction to blockchain, you can support multiple parties, and it's going to be immutable and secure, but it's not going to happen in real time. It may take minutes or even hours for a transaction to fully commit. So the sorts of transactions that are ideal for blockchain are like multi-party real estate transactions, you know, where a lot of different parties have to sign the paperwork, and then you know, once everybody signs, then everybody has to be able to verify that the other parties have signed. That sort of thing doesn't happen in, in a sub, you know, 30 seconds or less, right? That sort of thing it traditionally has taken weeks, and now blockchain can make it take minutes, but it's still minutes, it's not seconds. So for the sorts of transactions that PSD2 addresses, these are the ones that, that you're sitting in a store and you're waving your phone. You want it to take place in just a matter of a few seconds seconds at most. Blockchain is simply not appropriate for those. So different tools for different jobs. Okay, another question from Vinay. Uh, do you see such an API banking regulation being implemented in near term in the U.S. and Canada? And I can take this as I have been working in these regions. 
Uh, there currently is a lot of activity in Canada because most of the Canadian banks are fully international operations and as such will need to comply with all the partner regulations uh, from a worldwide perspective. As far as the U.S., there is a lot of activity. We are engaging uh, a lot of U.S. companies, uh, specifically those companies that have, again, major uh, international operations, which includes most of the uh, Tier 1 banking institutions. So it's real. It's happening. I'd say Canada's ahead of the U.S., but the U.S. companies uh, definitely have uh, a portion of their IT organization in place to completely understand and uh, um, monitor and then, you know, ultimately manage this implementation for their organizations. So, yeah, it's there and it's happening. Um, one of the another question from Rudy is what is the average implementation effort uh, to uh, implement AISP or PISP uh, as well as comply uh, with the PSD2 uh, you know overall uh, it's, that's a very good question what we're finding the implementation effort is uh, from a technology standpoint it's it's a medium it's uh, yeah a lot of the implementation Speed depends on the bank and its its own internal engineering processes, etc. But we'd say to get things up and running, especially with something like Fiorana, where you have a lot of the flows pre-built, and uh, uh, it really becomes it's really about a three to three to six month operation, could be less or more. But uh, you know, it's it's not it is a fair amount of work connecting to the core banking system and testing it and getting. The, Getting the handoffs, etc. So we would say, you know, ultimately, go live may be a uh, you know, four to eight month process. It, it really comes down to a case by case, individual basis. I, I think I'd like to uh, weigh in on that as a general comment. Uh, the reason that Fiorano is a little bit ahead of the curve at this point in time with this implementation is because many of our partners, our core banking partners, have come to us. Uh, because their experience with Fiorano is that anytime they need to provide complex integration for uh, to other banking partners or outside the bank, uh, to business partners that are in, engaged with the bank or consumers engaged with the bank, which would be mobile banking, uh, our core banking pro uh, partners have found that they can get a lot more accomplished in a lot less time at a lot lower cost by implementing Fiorano than implementing competitive solution or competitive product. So uh, in any case, Fiorano is going to be a far greater time to market at a lower cost than a lot of the competitive offerings out there. Uh, we've got a second, another question from Mo Mosin. Uh, as, as the presentation suggests the credit card processors out of the equation, who will manage the MDR and what would be business model? Yeah, that, that is the issue. That's one thing that the credit card processor does provide is they provide a certain guarantee to the, to the user that they get the money in a certain period of time. So yeah, th that is an issue that is not yet completely worked out. So the credit card companies are not completely out of the business. But that, that's scope for innovation again. It's the kind of thing that uh, currently is going, it's a void that's going to be filled. right? That's a business issue that needs to be addressed by by my banks, by by PISP, by by banks that want to take the take up the responsibility for the credit card companies. Essentially, the uh, the banks have more of a chance now to muscle in on the credit card uh, business. Whether it's a good or a bad thing, we don't know. But uh, there, there are there's going to be some competition in that industry. Uh, and just so everybody knows on the call, we will do our best to answer as many questions in the next eight minutes. And uh, if we don't get there, we will send you an email with an answer. Uh, next question is, Carlos, can you provide any example of how PSD2 regulation affects the corporate customer and in parentheses such as Inditex? The, PS, the regulation really makes, uh, makes things easier for everyone. So as far as the corporate customer goes, there's no real 
uh, downside effect. There's only upside effect in the sense that your transactions are easier, easy, easier to record. You have a, you have a single location where you can actually see all your transactions. Simplifies simplifies things for you. Okay, uh, another question from Toyhead. Uh, what all payment schemes are mandated to be supported in PDS to, uh, PSD2? Is it just SEPA? Uh, I'm not completely certain about that. I mean, we'll have to get back on that. Really, any kind of online payment will work. So it's it's a anything that a bank allows you to do a wire transfer for today is something that uh, that will come under the PSP mandate. Uh, we'll have to get into more detail on if there's more standards there, like like, like SCPA. Uh, and this is an interesting question from Marcus. Where, in terms of PSD2 maturity, do you think the banks and potential TPPs are today and by the time PSD2 live date in 2018? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got some interesting information on that. Uh, we've spoken to a lot of European banks, and here's the situation. A lot of the big five consulting companies have been advising the banks to hold off on the implementation until the regulators really push them to do the implementation. So it's a very interesting situation. So there's going to be a point, and, and, and the deadline is 2018, so suddenly the regulator is going to say, all right, boys, go for it, and you're going to have 50,000, you're going to have a thousand banks saying, "I want PSD two yesterday." So, uh, a lot of a lot of the larger banks have already started the implementations, and our, our projects have started. But there's a close to fifty thousand European financial institutions that actually have to implement this, and uh, that there's only a handful of them that have actually that are in that are in process. So, so yeah, everyone's just waiting. It's because the regulation was only out on Feb 23rd this year, in, in all honesty. And most people really, the regulation can be read and understood, but most people don't know what it looks like, you see. So we've actually attempted in this webinar to show you what it would actually look like, what the flows would look like, what it actually means. And I think that this understanding is going to help people a lot. At least when we talk to the next, they really get it. So, so yeah, they, they're all waiting for the next guy to do it. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting because, you know, obviously they're, these are risk-adverse organizations and they're perceiving a risk of being too early, you know, because then they have to figure their stuff out and they would rather somebody else figure it out and then just follow the lead. But but there's a risk being too late as well, and there's a number of them. Obviously, one is just not, not meeting the deadlines, but two, it's like once this floodgate's open, you know, finding uh, consultants or, you know, professionals who can do this stuff, I mean, it'll be a scramble for these companies, and they'll all, they'll all get booked up. So so don't wait too long, or you won't be able to find anybody to help you. <laughs> That's yeah, we've got true. another question from R.K. Subramanian. What kind of message will be sent by the customer's bank to the PISP when it initiates the payment with the beneficiary bank? Uh, an ISO 20022 message. Pain one, pain two message. Well, that was simple. Um, uh, we we have uh, this is interesting from Abhishek Pandey. Abhishek here uh, does the concept of PISP and AS, AISP already exist in the banking system? Not yet. This is a new set of concepts, so in logically these sort of third parties are created. In practical terms, the bank will become the third party. The bank will do the job of the PSP, but not yet. Absolutely. This is a new PSD2 thing, yes. And, and that's why it simplifies things. That's how you get a front office in the cloud. Okay. And from Thomas, uh, Opening up accounts and payments through PSD2 regulation in Europe creates opportunities for new business models and fintechs. Do you see similar trends opportunity outside Europe with your clients and prospects? Yes. For instance, any bank that closes a transaction in Europe has to implement the regulation as well. So, for instance, banks even in Japan, right? Uh, are going to have to implement this regulation. And since the regulation actually makes a lot of sense and does simplify retail banking a lot, over time it is it is 
very, very likely that that it's going to be implemented and taken up by a lot of countries. Because the lead, the lead is really something, you know, a lot of emerging market countries in Africa in fact do this. Yeah, and I think yeah. that, yeah. as mentioned, uh, we believe that Canada is well on its way to uh, the Canadian institution, banking institutions are well on their way. The U.S. institutions have infrastructure in place to monitor and manage this process moving forward so they're not lost when it comes time to implement. And I know as well that the Latin American countries are very, very focused on this because most of Latin American companies rely on European and uh, North American banks for their major banking processes. So. Uh, there is going to be opportunity worldwide as we view it. Yeah, I would I would uh, uh, second both Atul's mention of Africa and Tom's mention of Latin America. Really, if you look at the emerging markets around the world, uh, the, tr the overall trend there is the leapfrog trend, right? The, uh, many of these countries have leapfrogged wired internet and have gone straight to uh, uh, you know the mobile smartphone infrastructure, and now payments are now being. Uh, driven on this is you know, many of these um, countries people just don't have bank accounts so so they do all of their banking all of their payment infrastructure on their phones and in, in those sorts of situations and, and as, as um, Tom mentioned uh, you know these sorts of countries look to European and American banks to provide the, the underlying banking infrastructure so so there's huge opportunity Latin America Africa Southeast Asia all around the world in terms of uh, you know, Central Europe uh, Central Asia uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, opportunities to support, uh, you know, PSD2 business models and uh, uh, business models that can take advantage of the overall uh, uh, mobile-centric payment infrastructure in these countries. I think we have time for one more question, and this is from Tuhin. Uh Will there be an authority to maintain PISP, AISP details against which the banks can validate the authenticity of a TPP posting? To be PISP slash AISP. Yes, that's the regulator. So the regulators are going to be, uh, you know, essentially quite vigilant, and that's uh, that's a favorite European thing anyway, regulation. So uh, they're going to be maintaining tabs on all these organizations and making sure they comply. Okay. At this point, um, we are running at the nine o'clock, the one hour time limit. Um, we will look at your remaining questions and respond to you as quickly as we can. And uh, we'd like to thank you for attending the webinar. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Atul, for your insight. And we look forward to hearing from you and working with you in the future. Thanks very much for your time today.